Good evening, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this morning or this afternoon, we shall be talking about independent Jamaica and the fact that we might not be as independent as we think we are. But let's heading, you know, we often talk about independence. And what does independence mean? And every year we celebrate it, but I think we're more interested in the parties and the dance and the festivities rather than contemplating and having a deep, deep reflection on what independence really means. And throughout the world now, where people are actually asking themselves, are we as a people actually independent, including in the very powerful United States. The citizens in that empire is as, you know, are asking themselves, are we really independent of the US empire? Or you know, is it that we are enslaved to that system? Now, these are important questions that we need to ask in Jamaica. Are we independent as a country that is economically dependent on other nations where we have over 60% of our produce, right, of what we eat, of what we consume uh, coming from North America and other countries? Are we really independent if we are not self-sufficient as a nation? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. But people often think independence means that you have a flag and you have a national anthem and that you have a domestic government. And that is what constitutes independence. But I am here to tell you that independence means much more than that. And if you are not economically independent, it means that you are not independent, right? Remember now that we have parents, right? And when you have your parents, your parents take care of you during your childhood into teenage years. And then when you move on into adulthood, then you have to take care of yourselves. But if you're living with your parents when you're an adult and they're taking care of you, it means therefore that you are still dependent on them until you've moved out and you're taking care of yourself, right? All the bills and you're taking care of your mortgage or your rent, whatever you're doing and your food and just taking care of yourself without any economic input of your parents, it means therefore that you are independent of your parents. Now, we find ourselves not being economically independent. We are still economically dependent as a country. We are borrowing from, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry. And then, oh, all nations have to borrow, then it might be so. But we have found ourselves not even sufficiently trying to produce things that we could produce so that we could also pay down on our debt. Instead, we choose to um, just to, you know, allow people to import and to flood our markets with their produce. And then we keep on borrowing from these same people then how are we going to become independent when we are practicing that sort of slave-like mentality? We will never become independent, you know, and that is what I'm suggesting to us, that we've got to lay the foundation. We've got to prepare the soil of prosperity because if there's no soil for prosperity, it means therefore that we are never going to be fully free. And I think that the Jamaica that we have in 2024 is more of an enslaved society. In 1962, when we became independent, political independent, that is, I think we had more prospects because at then we had an economy that was, you know, more self-sufficient. It was more, it was not self-sufficient, but it was more self-sufficient. And had we created policies, domestic policies, to be able to push forward that economy, I think that there would have been hope. And there was hope that we could have eked out an economy, uh, a higher standard of living that we find ourselves, that we are not really living right now. But we decided because of the tribal politics and the partisan politics that we would divide ourselves. You know, the elites would divide themselves into different camps, into the JLP camp and into the PNP camp. And we find ourselves right now that we have moved off the road of prosperity and we are heading on the road of destruction, economic destruction. And there are people who are still 
clamoring that we have moved on and we have been doing well and we have made significant improvements over the years. Now, we have made some modest improvements, I would say, in education, in healthcare, right, um, in just some of the facilities that we have there. But in many ways, we have not really progressed. And I think that we would have had these things even if we had not become independent, right? These modest improvements would have been made because the world moves on, right? The world is not static, all right? Societies evolve. So we would have evolved and we would have had these things nonetheless, whether or not we were independent. But independent Jamaica means a country in which people would like to live and feel secure and that they think that they can eke out a prosperous life. What we find in modern Jamaica, particularly now, especially in recent years, but after the second or whatever, the, the IMF agreement that was inked out in 2013, we find a lot of our citizens are migrating. And we see where loads of teachers, a mass exodus of teachers and nurses and doctors are leaving the Jamaican society. And people are realizing that they are not able to survive on the salaries that Jamaica is actually paying them so they have to find, you know, greener pastures so that they can take care of themselves and their families. So what significant improvement have we made if the large majority of our citizens are, you know, departing or leaving or immigrating every year? 85% of our graduates, university graduates, that is, tertiary graduates are leaving Jamaica per annum. Now, what significant progress is that? And I'm not suggesting here that people are not free to leave. I am not suggesting that. I'm here suggesting that if the economy was prosperous and if we had made the significant uh, achievements, improvements that some people are telling me that we would definitely have not seen, we would not be seeing, we would not be witnessing the mass exodus of our people, to other countries where they are going to be second class citizens, in, in some cases, third class citizens, right? Because they're never going to be first class citizens in a foreign country, right? But because we have not carved out a situation in which our people can prosper economically, socially, right? It means therefore that people find themselves leaving. I would not even mention the crime, the fact that they do not feel secure in their own space. So they've got to leave. They've got to immigrate to another country where they feel more secure. Now, you know, it's interesting to see um, we have here Norman Gervon, who was a professor of economics, um, a Jamaican professor. I think he also taught the University of the West Indies. Um, that's at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad for many years and a very perspicacious thinker and scholar. He is one of Jamaica's finest intellectuals. And I think that he speaks it as it is. And he calls a spade a spade. He's not pretending to be an intellectual as most of our intellectuals do and who have not yet understood the Jamaican reality and not able to itemize and to present our problems and to devise, as it were, possible solutions. But Norman Gervon, Professor Norman Gervon, you know, I've always been impressed with his intellect. The first time I met him, incidentally, was at the Jamaica 50th you know, celebration of independence in 2013, right, at the Pegasus Hotel, when he was talking about that we are still independents, we're not independent. Right, So we're still in dependence. So we're depending on others to take care of us. And he was giving a speech where, in which he was critiquing some years ago the, the domestic constitution, the Jamaican constitution. And that what we have as a constitution came from Britain and that our forefathers, right, our founding fathers, Norman Manley and um, Buster Manley, Bustamante, rather, they were proud to have just replaced the British constitution and just give it to us like that. It was not properly thought out. It was a properly written constitution, to that one that reflected our reality. 
right, coming out of slavery. It was it, it much more reflected the British reality, the slave master's reality and what they went through. And I'm not suggesting here that some of the, you know, the, the, the characteristics, some of the things in the British constitution are not very good for us because I'm sure they are, but there are things that we should have included, right, that would have dealt with our social, economic, and political realities, which would have been distinct from the British realities. But that is what our founding fathers did, right? The Norman Manley and, you know, and Bustamante, because they wanted to be the, what should I say now, the, the, the founding members of the nation. But I think what was done was because independence was foisted upon us because the British Empire fell in 1955 and they were not, no longer interested in having us. And I think the Americans might have also pushed them into that because the Americans run the show. Their empire had started now to, it was flourishing and they didn't want any competitor in this region, right? In the, as you know, Americans like to say that the Caribbean and Latin America right um uh, they are just members of in their backyard so the fact of the matter is that independence was foisted upon us it's not something that we really sought it was something that the british in fact i think um mr golding brought that out in his lecture i think it was mr golding in uh that from 1957 thereabout you know there were hints that we were really self-governing is it is, is it mr golding or some i might have read it before but it could have been that he brought that out. He reinforced it. But in 19, by 1957, we were actually self-governing. We were governing ourselves. I think only in the areas of national defense, and there was something that the British were responsible for, but we were a self-government from 1957. The British were giving us that cue from then, even before 1962, that we were going that route that they had to give us up because they could not afford to keep us as their empire had died, <laughs> right? They had lost their empire. The sun had set, even though the British doesn't like to, 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 to acknowledge that, but the sun had set on their empire and the American empire was up and running now, this is what Norman Gervon is saying um, in a critique he made of the Westminster, Westminster um, system of government. And let me see if I can share my screen with you so that you can see what I'm reading from. But in it here, he says behind the independence pact. He says the independence pact was made between the British with the Americans hovering watchfully in the background and the Jamaican political class that had emerged out of the mass movements of the 1930s. The Jamaicans would exercise formal political authority. The economy would remain in the hands of foreign firms and the local oligarchy. So that is what it is. The economy is within the hands of the foreign firms. And who are these foreign firms? They're largely, or they were, and I'm sure are still owned by American firms, right? And then we have the local oligarchy. He says that my doctoral thesis showed that at the time of independence, American, British, and Canadian firms were entrenched in bauxite mining, sugar, banking, and finance, while local landowners and merchants controlled the best land, tourism, and import training. A key element would be a security apparatus with close links to the imperialist system. The core of the newly established Jamaica Defense Force was the Colonial West India Regiment. The officers attended courses at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst Ties with the U.S. were doubtless established soon after independence. Right. So the U.S. is the new um, soldiers in town, right? the new empire in town, and that is what we have to understand. We're not running the show and getting independence or removing the king as head of state is not going to solve the problem nor make us independent. What would make us more independent if we become more economically independent and we are able to stand up to some of the, you know, the, the, the policies and the sort of 
decisions that the United States would like us to make. Look at Venezuela. You know, Venezuela is standing up to the U.S. You might, whatever you think of Maduro, but he is suggesting that, you know, this is our country and we want to govern it the way in which we want to govern it. And that is why you have that diplomatic stalemate, right? That diplomatic role that we see between the United States and Venezuela. It's all about who is the boss and who should run the show. It has nothing to do with democracy as we're hearing in the media. And it's time for us to come to grips with these things. But we saw what happened in 2010 with the Dodo Saga and that we could not even have diplomatically, you know, dealt with that controversy, that debacle between the US and Jamaica. We, we, we could not deal with it um, through, you know, diplomacy, right? We, you know, the Americans went and they invaded and they killed, right? And they came and they stole and they killed and they allowed us to understand that we are the ones who run the show, that Americans run the show and that Jamaicans are not, you know, the ones who are the boss of that island, something that we have to understand. Now, the we we have here an interview that was actually done between this guy that went to Jamaica and his name was Ian Thompson, right? Let me see if I can pull back that interview with him, Ian Thompson. And he was talking about the whole concept of independence and the fact that Jamaica is not an in well, not a full independent country, right? The, the title of his book, he has written a book, The Dead Yard, Tales of Modern Jamaica, right? That is what the book that he has written, um, Ian Thompson. Let me see if I can find the interview about Jamaica, the book um, about, so we have Ian Thompson, um, interview about Jamaica. Yeah, so that's, for those of you who want to get the book, you can go and you can have that book. It's online. The Dead Yard, A Story of Modern Jamaica, right? So it's something that you want to probably put in your library. My understanding is that the the um, the Jamaican authorities have you know, blocked that book from, you know, from entering Jamaica when after he had written it. I think that there is a sort of, you know, thinking in Jamaica. And I think I used to think that way too, that, you know, foreigners ought not to study us. And oftentimes when they study us, they do not study us in an objective manner. Is either they're too extreme. They, they, you know, they say that we're so poor and we're so decadent. And another extreme is that we are this land of sun um, and sunshine, you know, and beaches and all of that stuff, the tourism sector, right? So we have no objective, a lot of times, analysis of who we are. But Jamaica is really a country of extremes, whether we like it or not. I think that that is what I had to come to grips with, that we are indeed a country of extremes, right? So you go to one section and you see extreme poverty, and you go to another section and you see extreme wealth. Now, the problem is that we're so small. So sometimes it's just a few blocks away that you'll see extreme poverty, and then a few blocks away, you'll see extreme wealth. I remember, um, what's her name? The former first lady um, of Jamaica, that is Beverly Anderson Manley, right? That's the former wife of Michael Manley. And in her interview that was done some times ago, when she was reflecting on the Manley era, and she said that she always was amused at the fact that having left the Breakfast Club, which was aired at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel, that she would just drive some blocks away, you know, probably a few minutes away from her, you know, from, from the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel on her way home. And what you would see is, you know, some level amount of prosperity. And then you move, you know, some um, blocks away, you're seeing extreme poverty. Now, how can we live in a country like that when, you know, just blocks away, maybe minutes away, you're between, you know, you know, um, signs of prosperity, right? And then you're seeing extreme poverty in the country, right? That is what she was suggesting, and that is true. So Jamaica is, in fact, a country of extremes, and I don't think that you will find a lot of balance in that country. And that is what the 
researchers when they go to Jamaica, they see, and we can't blame them for unpacking that. But let us look at what the guy was talking about. Let, us, let me see if I can share my screen with you, and we can look at what Ian Thompson, who is Scottish, by the way, and, you know, did in his research. There are some, of course, critiques about his book, but I'm sure there are things that we can find useful. Now, it suggests it, the interview, it was an, this, is, this was done by NPR and the Hopes Unrealized in Independent Jamaica. That was the title of the article. And at midnight on April, on August 5, sorry, 1962, Jamaicans hauled down the Union Jack for the last time and raised the new colors, black, gold, and green of independent Jamaica. In the capital of Kingston, 20,000 people gathered in the newly opened National Stadium to bid farewell to British rule. It was a grand and hopeful time. Britain's Princess Margaret attended the festivities along with Lyndon B. Johnson, then the Vice President of the United States, right? Um, who eventually became President um, some years after. But almost 50 years later, so this book was written in sometimes around 2011, thereabout. A lot of Jamaicans feel that since Union Jack came down, there has been large disappointment. Writer Ian Thompson tells Weekend All Things Considered, guest host Noah Adams. Parts of Jamaica are a vacation paradise, but much of the country is crippled by violence and corruption. And that is true, right? Much of the country is, and we cannot really um, say nay to that, right? Look at this, the level of poverty that we are seeing here. And, you know, in some cases, it might be worse. Thompson traveled all over the island and everywhere he went, people asked the same question, what has Jamaica done with its independence? And perhaps that should be a fitting title for the video this morning. Now, Thompson chronicled his search for the answer in his new book, The Dead Yard, A Story of Modern Jamaica, which you probably can find on Amazon. As again, it is not permitted, at least when it was published, it was not permitted um, to be read in Jamaica. Jamaican markets, you know, blocked its entry, right? I guess the government does not want our people to read it. Right. And that is what we're talking about. So what democracy are we talking about if we can't read a book and come to our own conclusions? Let Jamaicans read it and let them critique it for themselves and let them, you know, eat what is edible and that which is not edible. They can spit it out. Right. That is what democracy should be all about. Right. All sort of knowledge is important for the intellectual empowerment of citizens. So we have Thompson traveled all over the island and everywhere he went, people asked the same question and we talked about that. It's a difficult question for an outsider to answer. One woman challenged Thompson directly at a meeting of the Jamaican Historical Society. And I quote, this is what the Jamaican lady is saying, you visitors are always getting it wrong, she told him. Either it's golden beaches or it's guns, guns, guns. Is there nothing in between? And there might be some things in between, but very little in between, right? Because as we have suggested, Jamaica is a country of extremes, and that is what it is. And there are things in between, and we should say, but very little, not very noticeable. When people enter your country, when they land there, I'm not suggesting that, you know, you might not land and see poverty, but as they go throughout the length and breadth of the country, they should be able to see some in between. In Jamaica, what we see a lot of times as we travel the length and breadth of the country is the ex our extremes, right? The, the, this, this chasm between the rich and the poor. Thompson says that despite the grim picture he paints of conditions on the island, he also did his best to depict the good along, alongside the bad. And he says, one of the things I set out to do in writing this book is to look at the fabulous variety of this country, Thompson says. It's a whole kind of bewildering melting pot of different skin colors, different peoples, different religions, different creeds. So I was looking at that aspect of Jamaica in particular and celebrating it as such, you know, as much as, as I could. Now, so the questions were, and, you know, he was asked several questions about, you know, our society and where we are moving as a society. And, you know, and the picture that he presented was 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 quite bleak, right? The picture that he presented was something that was not really good. And this is a guy who has interviewed um a lot of people. So when he went to Jamaica, he went throughout the island, as I suggested, and he interviewed a lot of people. So yeah, I it's I, you saw that I was looking 
for my thing, right? So let's look at some of the things that he had to say in his interview. Now, Adams, this is an interviewer is asking him, and this is from the NPR, right? The national, what was it, uh, whatever radio? National, whatever, radio, production radio, I can't remember, NPR. What is NPR again? I know it's a radio, the, the national public radio, right? The national public radio. Now, Adams, we have the early hope for independence for Jamaica. Tell us that about that, please. So Mr. Thompson is responding. After independence, there was a sense that this colony was still in many ways Britain's pride and joy. And a lot of more elderly Jamaicans still feel this very strong tie to queen and country. That's to say to Great Britain. I think a lot of Jamaicans feel that since the Union Jack came down, there has been largely disappointment. Right, which I think that that is true because when you look at the surveys that were done, the polls that were done in 2010, 2011, they're about in 12, people were adamant that I think they would have been better off. And a large majority of the populace suggested that they would have been better off under the British rule, under British governance or government, right, because of what was happening in Jamaica at the time in 2012. And nothing much has changed. And that is when you study Jamaica, you realize that. Not much has changed, right? That is what, when people say significant, there have been significant improvements. People are wondering, as you travel there, every you know, people who travel there quite frequently are wondering, where is the improvement? I, I haven't seen great improvement since 2012, right? In fact, our economy, I would say, has contracted because of the rigid and austere, you know, IMF policies that were implemented there. And, you know, and our citizens were happy with it because, you know, it was a path to prosperity and our debt was being reduced. While the Kenyans in Kenya are suggesting, no, get away, IMF, right? Because we do not want your skullduggery and your demonic, you know, activities to be implemented into our economy, right? The Kenyans understand that, Jamaicans don't, because they are not as smart as the Kenyans are. And it's time for us to smart up and to understand how the world operates, right? And not just listen to the narratives given by our government officials. And we run away with it, we run with it, right? Because that is the only narrative in town and we do not have brains to assess and to understand our problems and the intractable challenges that bedevil us, right? So let's continue with what Thompson is suggesting, because there are things that he says that we can, you know, um, actually benefit from. And, you know, now we have here, and you're wondering, or you are wandering through the book, asking this question, wandering the country, did it work? Did independence do anything good for the island of Jamaica? And Mr. Thompson responded, well, obviously, in many ways, the nationalist movements that grew up particularly in the early 1970s in Jamaica under the, I think, great Prime Minister, Michael Manley, came forward in leaps and bounds. There was a whole sense that, that this nation had to forge its own identity. A Caribbean nation or Caribbean identity, independent of Britain, had to go it alone. Whether or not Jamaica, instead of falling into the independence camp, has fallen more into the sort of American camp, now is another matter. I'm going to repeat that. Whether or not Jamaica, and I'm sure he was, you know, as he went around the island, he was reflecting, and as an outsider, is able to come up with a, a better analysis than our locals who are blinded by this sort of um, patriotism, right? That we're proud we lick up with Talawa and look at how we're doing at Olympics. And at the time in 2012, we would have been proud, right? Because this is Olympics and we, you know, it was in London and we were doing very well, right? And that is what the country is built on, sports and entertainment. So he says whether or not Jamaica, instead of falling into the independence camp, has fallen more into the sort of American camp, now is another matter, right? And something that needs greater research needs further investigation. We know that Americans control, right? It's not anything that is a mishear, right? If you're living and you are facing reality, you're confronting 
reality is you understand America runs the show in Jamaica. And I think what's happened in some ways is that Jamaica is now a quasi-American outpost in the Caribbean. I don't think he needs to think that. I think that it is an American outpost in the Caribbean. It is an American outpost. And they treat us as their slaves. And we're they're proud slaves. We love to be slaves. I've been telling you that on this channel for a long time. Right? That we love to be slaves because we want our visas. Right? And we don't want to, to do anything to upset that country. So an estimated, I think, 55% of Jamaica's goods are imported from the U.S. 55% right, are imported from the U.S. and things that we can produce. But because of these economic agreements, right, the whole theory of globalization, and go back and w watch the video, Life and Debt. You ought to watch that video. I think it was uh, produced by Stephanie Black, right, and she's also the writer of Born for Dead, right, with uh, both, I, you know, watched that film, and I also read her book, Born for Dead. And Jamaica is not an easy society. You know, and if you read Born for Dead, you will see that Jamaica is indeed a criminal society. And our politicians are proud of it, right? Because they like they shut up behavior, they are shut up, right? And that's why people like the Vibes cartels are being lauded and, you know, uh, and being coronated, as it were, in independent modern Jamaica, right? One of the most backward countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. But that is what we like, and that is what we have to accept. Now, let us look at Adams asking him another question, because we want to sort of, I wonder why this thing always comes when I'm online. Yeah, let me see if I can turn this off. Thank you very much. Right, so yeah, so let's get back into our discussion, right? There are always interruptions when we are involved in very important discussions. Now, yeah, I'm trying to, 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 to share my screen here and I'm doing all the things. Let me get here now. All right, so we have Adams. In many ways, the trips you would take from your various locations out into the countryside or into Kingston, for example, which is a town with a lot of drug balance were dangerous for you as a writer or someone as a Scottish person. They would always ask you where you were from and what sort of person you were. The murder rate in Jamaica, your book says, is annually 1,500 people. Jamaica only has 3 million. Did you get into some pretty tough situations, right? So 1,500 murders per annum in a country of 3 million people. And yet things have improved dramatically, right, with that sort of murder rate. And we're happy, right, because we're nickel but we're Talawa. Now, well, I knew that Jamaica is, you know, one of the most violent countries in the world on a level, let's say, with South Africa and Colombia. And by the way, South Africa and Colombia have improved. This was interview was done in 2013. Right? These countries are no longer the top. They might be there, but not. They have improved dramatically. And even El Salvador has improved. But Jamaica continues to be consistently one of the most murderous countries in the world. And I think that independent Jamaica is proud of that, right? We're proud to dance and to, you know, and to entertain the the, the ghetto um dance hall people and their lyrics, right? That we dance and we showcase ourselves and then we cry, we shed, you know, crocodile tears when our family members and friends die when we're in the dance hall whining and dancing to their nonsense, right? because we are mentally deranged. We are mentally sick. Now, the, he, let's look at something else that he is, you know, here reporting. So he says, but I think cruelty and violence, I like he's, you know, historicizing, he's putting into historical context where our violence came from. But I think cruelty and violence has been implicit in the British Imperial project in Jamaica for three centuries. And it isn't also in the American you know, project because they too are a violent society. The empire, the American empire is violent. And we have to understand that violence is inextricably interwoven in all 
imperial undertakings in all empires. So the United States is no less, but the United States has racked up this, you know, gigantic military apparatus that makes it even so more violent than previous empires. So it's inevitable, but that some of this cruelty of the plantation and the lash should linger still in different ways. The communist thinker Karl Marx famously said that Jamaica's history or Jamaican history, I didn't know that he said this, so I wonder where he got this from, but let us read it. So the communist thinker Karl Marx famously said that Jamaican history is characteristic of the beastliness of the true Englishman. While I don't necessarily concur with that, I can see where he was coming from. And I think I concur. If you don't, I do concur because the British were really violent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that Professor Orlando Patterson, the Jamaican intellectual at Harvard University, did suggest that Jamaica, you know, went through one of the most brutal, I think he said the most brutal of all the slave systems in the new world, that our system was the most brutal, right, form of slavery that any country could practice on another. So hence the level of the level of violence. You know, because when you think about it, he spoke about, you know, um, Professor Orlando Patterson spoke about the fact that slaves in Barbados were bred for the most part, right? They were not just killed and a new fresh batch taken from Africa. But in Jamaica, that was the case that the slave masters did not put much value on the slaves because they could always replenish them from Africa. So you had them just, you know, working them to death, right? And that was happened in North America. The same thing happened, that slaves were actually bred. They were allowed to procreate. In fact, you had markets, as I'm even learning, reading afresh this week, uh, as I'm reading about American slavery also, that, you know, the American planters in the South, you would have markets where people would actually capture you know, women, um, that's black women, you know, African women, African Americans to to actually um you know breed them, to have them bred for the market, right? So you'd have businesses, corporations that would have these women and they would capture them and they would, you know, have them be bred and they would produce um children for the slave market. In Jamaica, on the other hand, you know, that did not happen. What you had was the fact that slaves you know, were, you know, worked to death, just like what happened in Haiti, and then they they would be replenished by new slaves coming from Africa. That was better for the slave masters, many of whom, by the way, did not reside in Jamaica, and that could be why that would have been the case. Barbados was more of a separate nation. America, as you know, was also a separate nation, so the slave masters lived there. So, you know, they did not want to have to be constantly, you know, buying fresh slaves from Africa. And perhaps they wanted the slaves who understood the culture and did not have to deal with, you know, because they would have understood the language, the children, you know, spoke English and could understand the slave master's language and, you know, and they could communicate better uh, than if you had gone to Africa to send them, you know, it would have been much more of a struggle. But because, again, Jamaica's most of the planters were absentee. Um, planters, they were not residing in Jamaica, so they didn't have to deal with all of that, you know, um, challenges, linguistic challenges, as it were. So here, you know, the question has been asked about the book. Let us, you know, see what he's talking about the book or what he's saying about the book, I should say. Now, uh, let me open up my screen again. So here we have the name of your book is The Dead Yard. What is that phrase? And where does that come from? And he's talking about the dead yard and came from Spinner Awake. Most of us know that and so uh, stuff like that. Now, um, uh, let's, they always thought that you were going to get it wrong. So many visitors think that Jamaicans, you know, many Jamaicans think that when, you know, scholars come to the island, they're going to get it wrong in terms of the story of Jamaica. Um, about the narratives, about the analysis that they make. And sometimes they do get it wrong, and I call them out also. Get it wrong about the sugar industry, get it wrong about the music, get it wrong about the drugs and the crime. And Mr. Thompson says, yes, 
all of that. But one of the things I set out to do when writing this book was to look at the fabulous variety of this country. Jamaica is not only populated by descendants of African slaves, but by white British, by Shabardi Jews, by Lebanese businessmen, by Chinese. So it's a whole kind of bewildering melting pot of different skin colors, different peoples, different religions, and different creeds and backgrounds. Right. So in that way, Jamaica's very modern society, and we have always been a modern society. I think the Caribbean and Latin America have been the modern, more modern before the United States became modern. And you find that whole system in America right now by who is black and who is white. And is Kamala white or is she black and all the nonsense that they're having there? Because they have not yet grown up to understand different peoples and different cultures and different nationalities. And most Americans are still not able to distinguish as basic as it is, as basic concepts as they are, they aren't able to distinguish between nationalities and ethnicities and cultures. It's just something very difficult for them to understand, right? Because <laughs> Kamala Harris is an American of Jamaican and Indian descent. What is so hard to understand about that? What is this thing? Is she black? Is she Indian? Whatever. She is first American because that is a culture from which she hails. She's not Jamaican because she does. She has never been immersed in the Jamaican culture. She's not Indian because she has never been immersed in the Indian culture. She is quintessentially American. That is what she is, right? And Americans are all immigrants. They have all come from countries, right? Of you know outside of America, right? So I don't know what, the, if the history has been lost here or people are just plain dumb and dunce, right? But the Caribbean and Latin America have always understood that they have lived with all of these people for years and that they are Dominicans or they're Colombians or they're Jamaicans or they're Trinidadians or, you know, Barbadians. You don't question the person going up because the person looks mixed that, oh, is that person Indian or whatever, you know? The person is first Barbadian, and then we can question their ethnic background and all of that stuff, right? So nothing is wrong with wanting to know and, you know, where this person might have healed from and the cultures, the forefathers, and, you know, what they might have involved in. Nothing is wrong with that. But when we begin to question people's identity, especially when we know that they're linked to the culture, to our culture, and to other them, Something is wrong and it is dance. It's just plain dumbness. And, you know, I don't look up to people like that and who talk all the, that nonsense. It's Kamala or Kamala, <laughs> right? Is she black or is she whatever? What is blackness? What is whiteness? Um, you know, nothing but the color, right? Grow up. All right. So we have been more modern for a longer time than people in North America and other parts of the world. But we are lacking in other parts and we have not modernized in terms of the economics, uh, in terms of a lot of our educational thing, we have not modernized. There are other things that we need to, you know, modernize and to make ourselves competitive in. Now, Norman Mandy gave a speech after we had become independent. It's a long speech, and I don't think that we should go through it. Um, and... This is how he ended his speech. Let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, that's Norman Mandy, one of the founding fathers of modern Jamaica, as he was, or independent. I shouldn't say modern, but one of the, the founding fathers of independent <laughs> Jamaica, for whatever it is. Jamaica in independence. Now, he says here, at the ending of his speech, history now gives us the role to create the new things which will make that nation lives and endure in the world to come. So let no man quarrel with history or question the judgments of the architect of the universe. So we need to look at our history, right? We need to look at our history. And this is what, you know, um, Manly is saying, comrades, we must never forget that we start with all the legacies of 300 years of colonial rule. And we have not taught the history very well. We would be foolish if we did not understand that you don't throw off all the patterns of behavior and thought that colonialism brings upon a people merely by becoming free. 
We can't just throw it off, as some of people expect us to do. We have tried hard in this country to overcome them, but they're not yet overcome. In the old days, each man sought his own good in the country, and each man that made his way up turned his back on where he came from, and each man who achieved a high place on the ladder went suddenly striving to bow the knee to wherever power was to be found in the colonial empire. Those patterns prevail in this country today, and there are still men who, in true colonial style, serve one party only, the party in power. The pips who bow the knee and scrape and fringe and deny and falsify principles so as to protect themselves and their positions. Maybe it is common all over the world, but it is particularly common in societies that have known colonial rule for generations, right? So yes, and I hear people saying that, yeah, whenever we talk about Jamaican problems, yes, it happens in other parts of the world. And yes, it might, and it is. But what if they're prospering more than we are prospering, right? We can't look at them and say that because it's happening there, it means that it should happen with us, right? We've got to really get ourselves together and get our acts together. I've been saying this for years, right? Not well, <laughs> I've been saying it, uh, you know, um, as long as I've had this channel course for years but you know um you have not many of you do not know me for years right you're just you're just meeting me as it were all right so this is what we're saying i don't think that we are independent um we are an independent nation i think that we are in dependence as professor the late professor norman gervon intimated We've got to really wake up to that. We're still independent. We're not dependent at all. We're not economically independent at all, as we're, as the, the writer Ian Thomas says that. Now, let us look at, you know, there was a, a review done by the New York Times of Ian Thompson's book, The, 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 the Dead Yard, Tales of Modern Jamaica. And, you know, it was a scathing review, but he highlighted some of the points that, quoted some of the points that uh, the author, Ian Thompson, mentioned in his book. And we want to look at some of them. I don't think that this reviewer was particularly impressed with, um, what's his name, Ian Thompson's uh, book, the writing, the book, you know, the content in, in, in that book. But, you know, there are some things that he quoted that we would, you know, need to address. Um... Yeah, so we have here, stand back and witness the bonfire Mr. Thompson makes from the kindling of modern Jamaican society. He calls it a place with no recorded ancient history, religion, or civilization of its own. It is a nation built on violence and morose vendettas. It is a vexatious and fear-ridden. It is vexatious and fear-ridden, sorry. It has a low literacy rate and it is one of the most violent countries in the world. It has no credible justice system, which is true, right? It has no credible justice system that we saw, you know, in the whole case of Vibes Cartel. Eight out of 10 children are born to unmarried mothers. It goes on. The doctor to population ratio in Jamaica is currently one to every 5,240, one of the lowest in the world. He suggests, it's, it, he suggests it may be a failed nation in a state of moral decomposition, a hating and hateful place and a kind of corrupted Eden, right? About its capital, it declares everyone in Kingston, uptown, midtown, downtown, seem to be frightened of everyone else, right? Some truths are mentioned therein, and we've got to grapple with some of the truths mentioned in this piece, right? In his book, in Ian Thompson's uh, The Dead Yard, a, modern ta a Tale of Modern Jamaica. I think that we have to deal with some of these, you know, uncomfortable truths, right? The whole matter of the children born to unmarried mothers and unmarried parents, the fact that, you know, we do not, our healthcare system has really decayed, it has improved. So even though Bruce Gordon was seeking to have access and to have Jamaican, you know, have this universal access to medical care, it was not possible under the, the current economic conditions that are in Jamaica, right? We need to get back to some, you know, 
paying a small fee because we need to improve on our healthcare system in Jamaica. Right? Now, look at what the independent, I think this is a newspaper in the, in the United Kingdom, right? The independent.co.uk. And they were also doing a review or they've done a review of Ian Thompson's work, right? The, the Dead Yard, a tale of modern Jamaica. And this is what they had to say about us, about the book. Jamaica is a country that exceeds its limitations, and we can agree with that. For example, India's GDP is 180 times that of the West Indian country, and Jamaica could fit inside it 300 times. Yet Jamaica won twice as many medals at the London Olympics, 12 to India's six, right? So which one is more important, GDP or medals at the Olympics? You decide what is more important. Musically, it shines beyond its scope too. Between the 1950s and 2000, Jamaica had produced one new music recording per 1,000 people each year, making it per capita the world's most prolific generator of recorded music. Jamaican culture has long been fashionable, and on Google Trends, a means of measuring how highly words feature in the search engine, in the list of most search countries, Jamaica comes a tight second to Russia, a country so big it makes Jamaica look like a minnow. In view of Jamaica's small financial and physical scale, it's logical to think of it as a statistical freak of nature, an anomaly to have such a broad world standing. How could such a tiny island? which is only this year celebrating 50 years of independence from the UK compete with superpowers like India and Russia, right? That's an interesting question. And that is why we are known to be a confounding island as Orlando Patterson, you know, actually describes his book, right? The confounding island, because it confuses many people, you know, how we can be that, you know, uh, visible a nation, powerful in terms of our culture, yet we have not been able to get a lot of other things right. It was with this question in mind that on the eve of Black History Month in the UK, I visited the London home of Ian Thompson, the author of the hugely successful and controversial Dead Yard, Tales of Modern Jamaica. Thompson studied the island intensely over the course of several years, visiting it and poring over its literature and contacting the Jamaican diaspora in Britain to get the migrators through point. I'm not sure why he did not contact also the Jamaican um, diaspora in the United States. Um, Jamaican, Jamaica was modern before Britain was, Thompson tells me, sitting in his study overlooking the greenery of Alexandra Park. What fascinated me about these Caribbean countries was that for me, they are the first modern societies. They were the first countries to have intermingling mixed race people across the color bar and who live with them and live with them peacefully. Have our problems, but they live with them peacefully, unlike Americans and British people also. Slavery runs through Jamaican life or Jamaican life today like the black line in a lobster, he writes, explaining in our interview. I think it's axiomatic that when you have had a slave colony, you are going to have a violent or going to have violence today because these places are founded on violence. 300 years later, the violence can't have worked its way out. It's got to be there still. Right? So he's thinking the violence to our colonial and um, past, right? And British colonialism and slavery were, you know, violence was the cornerstone of that sort of system, right? We ought not to deny these very important truths, right? And these important facts. And I think that we need to study more of the history and look at how the history has should I say, been transformed. And the United States, which is now the reigning empire, is using similar tactics in a different, you know, modern world um, and how the violence or and how that violence is being played out in modern Jamaica. So are we independent? No, we aren't. Can we become independent? I am not sure at this juncture if we can. I think we first have got to find ways in which we can eke out uh, an independent economic um, society. Bruce Golding 
on the platform, the lecture that he did at the Norman Mann School, the Norman Mann Law School uh, recently, you know, while the lecture was not bad, you know, because, you know, Bruce is known for his oratory and he can deliver something very intelligent. He's an intelligent man, right? And he's an elder statesman. We can't deny that and we can't throw the baby out of the bath water. I do not, however, get the feeling, get the understanding that our elder statesmen in Jamaica or politicians, past prime ministers, have garnered the wisdom that they should have at their age. And I hear Bruce saying that he's more concerned about human rights and the, the, the charter rights in Jamaica for Jamaicans and all of that things. And yes, we should all be concerned about human rights and rights for all Jamaicans. But if Jamaicans do not have economic independence, if they cannot earn a decent wage in which they can live and their families can also survive, you know, and live comfortably, then you can throw all rights outside because people, you know, wherever we go, whether it's America, um, where it's Jamaica, whatever country you are, if you are not economically independent, if you're not doing well economically, people tend at that time to um, actually, you know, exploit you, right? And to overstep your rights. And that is what we need to understand that human rights and our inextricably linked to economic independence. And if our country is not economically independent, we're going to have the situation in which rights are going to be um, abused. And that is why in the, you know, in the so-called um, ghetto, the garrison communities in Jamaica, that you find that, you know, children are being, you know, trafficked, you know, are being raped, you know, mothers are being abused because they have, you know, they have to depend on these you know, um, economic manufacturers, as, as it were, these drug dons and the kingpins to feed them and to take care of them economically. And they just have to surrender their rights into the hands of these people. And the state has lost its power. So if we become economically independent, I think that our rights are going to be better secured and people are going to be able to educate their 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 children and the, uh, uh, an educated society will become a society that is able to defend its rights to stand up for its rights right but until we become economically independent which bruce was not actually clamoring for right then all of this chart of rights and all of this republican status and all of the you know you know, renouncing the king, denouncing the king, whatever you want to do, replacing the, the king with a domestic Jamaican president, all of that will not really bring us any, you know, fruitful um, independence, right? So we've got to really assess our realities or social, economic, and political realities and understand that we veered off the road of independence. And as a result of that, we're reaping the rotten fruits of violence, poverty, and social decay. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you will subscribe. Remember now that you have to like the videos and leave a comment so that it can also spur the algorithms to suggest to the algorithms that you really like the video and they will share the video. If you do not leave a comment and like the videos, then the videos are going to remain on the platform without being shared with as many people as you would like, I'm sure, the videos to be shared with. Happy Emancipation Week. All the best. Bye.